we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed this morning I want us to discuss the question of death you may be young you may be old but this discussion get involved because all of us will go the way of death so the earlier we discuss it the better so the question of death now death is the act of dying the end of life the total and permanentization of all the vital functions of an organism permanent total cessation of all the vital functions of an organism a living being is something that sets all of us constantly thinking to depression the issue of death it sets all of us constantly thinking to depression there is something about death that we all don't fully understand there is something about death that we all don't fully understand and so sometimes you don't probe into it too much you may not have answers for all your whys because there's something about death that we all don't fully understand but we are not alone the early church also battled with the issue of death they had challenges the church in Corinth needed some answers to the question of death and particularly the fate of the dead in Christ they needed some answers they needed some answers we want to say that our faith is futile if the dead did not rise from the dead if death the dead in Christ will not rise from the dead then Paul says that our faith has no basis and we don't even have any base to come to church and our preaching is useless but the dead will rise again many people in the Greek Roman world believe that death extinguished life completely or led to a permanent but shadowy and insubstantial existence in the underworld now some believe that when you die that is the end others also believe that you are pushed into a shadowy kind of life uh, in what they call the underworld the concept of physical embodied existence after death was known mainly from fables and was thought laughable especially by the educated they thought that how can the dead decompose and come back to life and live in a body they felt that this was like an old tale they were also challenged with why some people die in the midst of prayer like it happened last week people die in the midst of prayer because the church in corinth prided themselves in the spirituals they had the gift to a fault such that the apostle Paul even had to come in and explain and ask you how to use this gift they had the gift they laid hands on sick people yet the sick never recovered they died some of these things they are also a challenge to them and to us so they had a lot of questions just as we also have a lot of questions but paul in first corinthians 15 deals with some of the corinth's denial and of confusion about the future future bodily resurrection in response to a letter they wrote in fact in first corinthians 7 paul told all of us that they wrote some letters to him and i'm sure that the question of the dead was also part of what they wanted the apostle paul to speak to 
Now, in his dealing with this challenge, he began with the need to hold on to the faith they have received in Christ based on the preaching of the gospel he gave them. And he ended by still encouraging them to hold on to the faith so that nothing will move them. Nothing will move them. Now, why is this admonition important? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through to 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through to 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Now, they are inquiring or asking questions about the dead in Christ. And then he begins by saying that, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and you took your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. Now, brothers, by this gospel, you are saved. If, the word is if, conditional, you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Why is he saying that they must hold on to it? Otherwise, they have believed in vain. I'll talk about that very soon. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. When we are talking about the gospel, we are talking about that which is of great importance, the gospel truth, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is what we call the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died, he was buried, he was raised for our sins. This is what we call the gospel. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And the scriptures, one word of the word scriptures is the law. The law. So what the law is saying is this. Christ came to this planet earth. He died. He was buried. He rose again. And this is the scripture. This is the law. Anyone who puts his faith in this gospel, according to Paul, is saved. But why is he saying if? Why is he saying if? The if is important because faith counts by hearing. He says that the gospel I preach to you, you heard and you believe. Just as faith counts by hearing, anything that destroys faith also counts by hearing. So, faith comes by hearing, and something else that you will hear has also the power to destroy your faith. So, he's saying that you are hearing too many things, but hold on to the primary one, the gospel, that you have believed. Whether the dead rises or not, that is not the first thing that you have to worry about. Worry about the faith. You hold on to it. And then he went on to explain the question of the dead and resurrection. I'll be doing that shortly. Now, when he was ending, that is verse 58, he also made an appeal still to their faith. This is the conclusion of this chapter. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Now, stand firm. Let nothing move you. What that means is that something can move you. That is why he is saying that hold on to the faith because something can disturb your faith. Something can disturb your faith. Let nothing move you. Then he said, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I pray that this morning don't allow anything to move you. Because something can disturb your faith, can move you. So just like the Corinthians, in our world today, people really do not understand how material bodies, subject as they are to sickness, death, and eventual decay, can live eternally. You see, this issue of the belief in the Corinthian church, what they were being disturbed with 
it is still with us today. It is not locked in the early church. It is still with us today. Now, some of the songs we sing in Ghana, or we hear our composers sing, or our singers come out with, some of them is like, Unipa So they also believe that once you die, that is the end. Then others also believe that, Asamandu, Asamandu, oh. Then when we go to school and they are teaching us about the religious studies, they teach us about Asamad. And so these beliefs are still with us. So sometimes the reality challenges your faith and it brings back all these beliefs. They are not gone. They are in our subconscious mind. So when reality challenges your faith, all these things come back again. Then you begin to question whether what you are hearing from us is true or not. That is why the Apostle Paul quickly went to guard their faith so it is not destroyed. That is the number one. This morning I came to tell you to hold on to your faith. Let nothing move you. Let nothing at all move you. So Paul dealt with this challenge by appealing to the truthfulness of the tradition about Christ's resurrection. To lay a firm foundation for the argument that it was only the first step in the resurrection of all diseased Christians. But my concern this morning is not about the resurrection, but how we will have to tackle the question of death itself, the issue of death. See, I want to bring to your mind that death is real and that the earlier we understand it the better so we want to discuss it that is why i came not about the resurrection of the dead for those of us here i know about 90 percent plus believe in the resurrection of the dead how many of you do believe in the resurrection of the dead yeah fine so let's look at the question of life and death I have said that there is something about death that we don't all fully understand. I have said that one. Yet, there are certain facts about death that we do understand. And I want to bring those things back so that we actually look at them this morning. Number one. Number one. One fact of death is that we shall all die. How many of you don't believe that? How many of you don't believe that we shall all die? How many of you believe that we shall all die? Whether you raise your hands or not, I don't care. But we shall all die. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the fact that we shall all die. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For death is what? The destiny of how many people? Everyone. The living should take this to heart. See, the living should be able to take this fact to heart that we shall all die. So sometimes he is saying that it's better to go to a funeral, the house of mourning, because that is the way of all of us. That is where we are all going. So you can learn something from death. Because death is a fact. We shall all go. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. 9 verse 10. I read this scripture in Pensa some few years back. Uh, and then they started kind of making some noise. I didn't know that they have found something there that I myself have not found. So I will tell you what they found. Whatever your hands finds to do, comma, do it with all your might, comma, for the realm of the dead, comma, where we are going. Their problem was where we are going. Yeah, that is what the pencil people saw. Because they, they, were, they are young, when they saw where we are going, they started making some noise. But we are all going there. Yeah. 
So the earlier you accept it, the better. That we are all going there. There is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. So that is where we are all going. So ladies, please, we are all going there. <laughs> we are all going there. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Just as people are destined to die once, people, all of us, are destined. Now the word destined and destination has the same root. So where you are destined to go is your destination. See, the, the, why we are alive is that your vehicle has not come yet. That is why for me, when I wake up, I sing certain songs. Like, I'm going to be oh, oh, I yeah, be to. The earlier you get ready, the better. And yet we are see her, I'm going to. So get your bag ready. So, oh, when you go to Kanesh, you hear Kanesh, 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 Kanesh. If you are not going there, don't join that one. Your vehicle will come. Only that I cannot tell you when. But when your vehicle comes, you must be ready and jump on board. Jump on board. There, there is nothing that we ought to fear. Because when we live, we live for Christ. When we die, we die for him. It is those of us in this part of the universe that see differences between death and life. But for him, it is the same. It doesn't change anything. Yeah. The difference between death and life does not change anything. You are still the child of God. Those of us here, we suffer and cry. But they don't. They don't. And sometimes, they don't mind what happens they take us away. May the Lord have mercy upon all of us. So we shall all die. The second fact about death is that death stinks. It is painful. Death is painful. It is painful. It is real and painful. Death is real because it is subjective. It is real because it is also objective. People die, and we also see people die. People who are so close to you will die. And then we also see people die. So death is real, and it is painful. Second Samuel 1, 25 and 26. Second Samuel 1, 25, 26. How the mighty have fallen. This is David lamenting, crying. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve, I grieve. That is the whole king of Israel grieving because of pain. Jonathan, my brother, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of a woman. So the old man, the king of Israel, grieves because of pain. Because of pain. And it doesn't, the pain does not affect the physical body. It is in the soul. No hand can reach there. It takes the hand of the Almighty God to bring their consolation. I pray that God will help us this morning. Now, the Apostle Paul told the church in Thessalonica that encourage one another with these things. Why do we need encouragement? Because of the pain and the grief that one day he that is to come will come. So be encouraged. One painful thing about death is that you, don't, you won't see the disease again no not on this side of the universe that is very painful and my dad fell sick for for some time and his body was destroying we we're praying but it was not getting better just growing worse and worse then one day i went to visit him because the day before, I had called him, and I saw that he was in so much pain. So the whole night, I was just tossing here and there. So early morning, I decided to go to see him. Then when I went and I saw him, I, I just couldn't hold my tears. He's my old man, my father. So I could just share with the pain. And... He is the type who always brings some questions, very, very affable, 
talk about things that you don't even imagine you will talk about, ask questions. But you will be lying there as if there is no human being there. Then once in a while you hear him make some noise, mm, then you see that your old man is there. So I pray that God, this man knows you and he's aged. So instead of allowing him to suffer, please let him go and rest. And then those standing around there, they, they responded, Amen. Even he himself, he responded, Amen. Two days later, I was reading my Bible in a small chapel, preparing for an evening meeting. Around 10 a.m., I had a call that my old man had passed. I was there alone, reading my Bible. I just bowed down my head like this, and tears began and streaming. The pages of the Bible were, were being destroyed by the tears. But I, as if I didn't have the strength to, to, to close the Bible. Tears was falling on the pages. And the pages were destroying. Then somehow I managed to gather some strength. Then when I got home, I just went straight to the bedroom and started packing. When my wife came, she saw my eyes. And then when I lifted my head like that, she also joined me in crying. Because we all knew that the old man was at the verge of death. And so when she saw my posture, and now I'm packing, she wouldn't ask any question but to join. You see, those days, the day I was crying, I was an apostle, and I'm still an apostle. See, when it comes to death and pain, it doesn't matter the level of your anointing. That is how real death is. It is painful. Then when I got home, and my mother saw me, and the typical Ashantis, when they see you like that, they, they are able to just create a lament, and then add you, and then cry, mentioning your name, connecting you to your father. And I thought that I should leave the scene, because there were so many people out there and I entered straight into my father's room. When I got to where his bed was, I wept like a baby. With all the apostleship, I wept. That is how painful death is. So I understand your pain. But for how long can we mourn and destroy the soul when the cross is lifted already? We have an anchor that should be able to keep our soul. So that was it. The pastor in my village my small town came to me later on so when they saw me crying they all kind of <laughs> left the scene then later on they came and then he said do you want to go and see him up until today i thought that my response was not correct i said yes i should have said no because what i saw still bleeds my heart because I loved my father. And I still weep. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I wonder why my father should die. I wish he were still around. So death is painful. And the fact that you will not see that fellow again makes the pain even worse. Up until today, I have not even had a dream seeing my father. It was my mother who said, Oh, Papa Baha, Anaji, and may I come with you? So, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> but if there's anything like that, at least she is picking it from a subconscious mind. So, this is what the scripture says about the death, the pain, and the death coming back to life. And the fact that we will not see that fellow again. Job 7, verse 9. Job 7, verse 9. As a cloud vanishes and it is gone, so one who goes down to the grave does not return. You will not return. The one that goes back to the grave doesn't return to us. And this is a fact of life. Another fact of life is this. Death is a fearful thing. It is frightening. I wasn't here to see what happened the other day. But you see, if you're holding the hands of your lover, let's say your wife, or let me say your spouse, and then the person falls down dead, 
and you realize that the fellow is dead, the first thing you do is to back off. You don't go close. Even doctors, when they are operating on you and they realize that you are dead, they remove their gloves and then they back off. That is how fearful it is. So we are all afraid to die. So when you dream that you are dying, if you don't take care, you go and consult a fetish. Because we all don't want to go that way. But today I want to tell you that that is the way all of us are going. And so prepare so that we will be able to embrace it when our time comes. Death is something that is frightening. Second Samuel 2 verse 23 you can write that one down. Then the next fact of life is this. Death is a serious matter. Death is a serious matter. Death gives no room or space for amends. When you die, you don't go back to reconcile with anybody. When you die, you don't go back to make amends. At least, I'm sure you all are aware of Luke chapter 16 from verse 26. The rich man wanted to come back and then maybe become a preacher now. But Abraham said it is over. There is no space now. You can go home and read Luke 16 from 26 to 31. But let's go back and read Hebrews 9, 27. Hebrews 9, 27. Death will not give space for anyone to make amends. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so once you die, the next thing is to face judgment. So whatever you did in your body, you will stand in judgment and account for what you did in your body. I met this man who was mourning maybe too much. I thought that after the wife was buried and some months have gone by he should have been able to overcome the grief but to me i thought he was not managing it well so i went close to him then i asked what is the problem what is the problem and then he said this to me i will never forget he says that sometimes i feel that i killed my wife i killed my wife sometimes i feel that I killed my wife. So why do you have that feeling? Then he started narrating some stories to me. He never lived at peace with the wife. We didn't know that he was always on the nerves of the wife. Now the woman is gone. The woman cannot come back. And he also, the living, does not have any space. To make amends. The dead is gone. She will not come back. And this man cannot also make the correction. Death is a serious matter. So all of us, in preparation for death, you have to know that there is no space for you to make any correction once you die. Try it as the rich man did. Abraham said, there is a gulf between me and you. You can't jump over. You can't jump over. Let me go and be a preacher. He says, stop. Moses and the rest are preaching. Today, I'm sure heaven will say, Nyamiche and the rest are preaching. Listening to them. There is no space. Now, I've reserved two to the last. That one will, will challenge our minds a bit. But I intentionally reserve those ones for us to keep thinking about them. So, I've come to the last two. Death is an enemy. Death is an enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then he moved on to tell us when that was going to happen. Verse 27. For he, he has put everything under his feet. Now when it, it says that everything has been put under his feet, it is clear that this does not include God himself 
who put everything under Christ. So until Christ sits on his throne and God puts everything under his feet, death will continue to disturb humanity. Now, if death is the last enemy, then I want to suggest to all of us that death plays a role in God's agenda for mankind. Death plays a role. The only thing that maybe death does that is good <laughs> is this. When it comes around, it tries not to pick too many people at a time, at a particular place. It, it tries. So when he picks a lot of them, then they will say that this is a genocide, this is what, this is what. So death is a bit strategic. <laughs> Listen to me. Today after the discussion, you may have the space to discuss again. Let's say that we are all living on the same street. Uh, First Avenue, huh? Uh, number one, house number one, number two, <laughs> number three, house number four. When he picks house number one, he won't pick number two. If he picks two and he picks three, by the time he gets to four, this one has vacated the first. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he will travel outside in the country. So he picks one, and then he leaves the people here as if he's not there, and go and pick another one from another avenue. By the time he comes here, the people have forgotten that he picked someone here. I'm sure it is operating on some instructions. And so that the human being is not too scared about it. Because even one out of us, at the full glare of us, brings some fear. What about ten at the same time? So death normally will not do that. I thought you would clap for death. <laughs> yes, yes. How many of us will clap? Whether you like it or not, these things are facts. The earlier you understand them, the better. How can 120 something people die at Accra Sports Stadium? That was just too much. That is not uh, what we want. Death will pick us, but it picks us one by one. But it is an enemy. Death has power to destroy, to disturb to disengage. I said death has power to do what? To destroy, disturb, disengage. Since it is an enemy, it doesn't come to your home to do you good. If death is an enemy, it doesn't come to your home to do you good. Certainly, it will take a father away. It will take a mother away and leave the children bleeding. It doesn't do anyone good. It will take your husband away. It will take your wife away. It takes children from the hands of parents. And they bleed. They bleed. Death. The two more day, They bleed. Death terminates contracts. When you have a contract and you don't actually sign it well and you are the boss, when you die, it is over. Sometimes you are even dead. And the people know that you have a contract. Your company has a contract. Yet yeah, because the main person is dead, wicked people will make sure that their contract is terminated. So death terminates contracts. It disengages marriages. It brings an end to marriages. Death terminates your job. If you are the chief executive in a certain company and you die, that position is not reserved for your child. That is the end. Death terminates all these things. Death terminates all these things. Appointments, relationships, death will terminate it. Your office, death will take it away from you. But I'll combine it with this one, and then I'll draw some conclusions. Another fact of life is this. No one dies for himself or herself. You don't die for yourself. Now, if death picks you, and it doesn't leave any ripple effect on the living, then death will not have been too painful. But death picks you and it leaves some effect on the living, especially the close uh, family or close friends. Romans 14, verse 7. Shall we read together, ready to go? For none of us lives and none of us dies for ourselves alone. The next verse is nice. 
But so let's read the next verse, and I'll come back to this one. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So this one can stand on its own. Because this is a fact. And, but the verse 7 can also stand on its own. So let's go back to the verse 7. Shall we shout it? Ready, go. For none of us... So what does that mean? What it means is that you just don't die for yourself alone. The effect of your death is on the living. I went to this school and I saw this lady. I was looking for her, but they said she was praying. I knew where we used to pray, so I was sure she was there. I was getting close to the prayer room. I peeped and I saw that she was there alone, praying. But she's taking a chair, like that. And then she was also sitting on a chair. Then she was pointing the hands to the empty chair like this. So I got closer and then made sure that I heard what she was saying. She was saying that you, God, you took my father away. Then she said, who will pay my school fees? You pay, you pay. And she started crying. When she started crying, I just left the place. I didn't want her to see me. But he said, you have taken my father away. There is school fees to be paid. And then she's saying that you, you will pay. And then she started crying. Sometimes you don't even know how to pray in the midst of death. If the man died and the man had gone without all these troubles, death would not have been too painful. That is why there are some people who say, who did you Yeah. And sometimes the wickedness of death is this. It comes to a home. And then it is so wicked that it takes the breadwinner away. If death has actually discussed with the Abushia Penny, they would have given death another person. Yeah, because they would have given death another person. But he just goes and then picks the breadwinner. And then he leaves the whole family destroyed, tattered, without hope. It is because of this that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. In this fallen world, you better understand the issues so that you don't destroy your heart. Your faith should be kept.